Hey everybody, it's Galnadex, and welcome to the December 2023 Qualifier Playing Event. This is going to be a competitive best of one Lost Caverns of Ixalan sealed event where we'll be competing for entry into the upcoming Qualifier Weekend. You can enter this event as many times as you want using 4,000 gems or 20,000 gold, but these events are also the only place you can spend your play-in points, so if you have any leftover like me, this is a great time to turn those play-in points into some gems. And since I've got quite a few leftover play-in points, I'm pretty happy with whatever happens today, grabbing some more gems for the collection, but it should still be pretty exciting to play some high-stakes competitive sealed of the newest format. Without further ado, let's bust open these packs and see what we get to play with today. Alright, well those are certainly some rares. Obviously three lands is pretty disappointing, but two of these lands are kind of spicy if we do end up playing blue, black, and red. Any of the lands that can turn themselves into creatures to start attacking later in the game tend to play it really well because they make sure that you don't flood out while also fixing your mana early. So I do like these rare lands. It is just a bit awkward to have three rare lands in the sealed pool. As for the actual spells that we've opened up here, the Belligerent's a really nice one. Whenever you attack with this vehicle, you're able to basically keep casting spells off the top of your library as long as you have the mana to cast them. So if you hit three spells in a row and they're all really cheap, then you could cast them all in the same turn and play your land for turn off the top. The one part where you don't get a ton of card draw going off of this is if you have like two lands in a row, because then you play one land off the top and you can't play an additional land that turn. So that's the only way that you kind of get stuck there. Or if you just don't have enough mana to cast all the spells you're hitting, but the belligerents can still be just a big vehicle that functions as a huge card draw engine as well. So I do like the belligerent a lot. As well as the Everflowing Well, this one's much more straightforward. It's just immediate card draw for the mana cost. Decent little sorcery kind of spell there. To draw some cards, it leaves this artifact sitting on the board so you can craft with this artifact later or tap it to any of your other effects. And if you manage to get eight or more permanents in your graveyard, you get to start turning one of your lands into like a creature to smack your opponent in the face with every time you cast like another creature spell. Technically, there's other things you can do with the myriad pools, but in sealed, that's the most likely scenario. If you top deck a big creature late game after you flipped this, then you kind of turn one of your lands into a copy of that creature for a turn, so you get an extra little attack out of it. So solid stuff from that. And of course, the flanker. Pretty average, pretty basic stuff. Like if we're playing white, we're going to play it, but it's not super powerful or super exciting. It's just a flexible, versatile card. Taking a quick glance over the sealed pool as a whole now, I like to start off with the multicolored and the colorless cards. Multicolored cards could show us specific synergies that we could go after if we have any really powerful of these signpost uncommons. Here we only have the Kutsil Malamet Exemplar, which is a fine green-white card. Can be a card draw engine if we're getting plus one plus one counters onto our cards, or putting equipment onto them, or just giving them extra power in any way, then we can be drawing extra cards, which is nice. But that is it for multicolored cards that we haven't seen yet, so not a lot to think about there. We'll just keep green-white in the back of our heads. And for the colorless spells, it looks like our fixing is not the greatest. There's one Sunbird Standard and one Compass Gnome, and no... Well, no, there is one. There's that rare Sunken Citadel. I was going to say there's no colorless um, mana-fixing lands that we have, but we actually do. The Sunken Citadel technically is basically like an Evolving Wilds or Terramorphic Expanse, where it hits the board tapped, and it's whatever color you choose when you play it. So that is actually decent. With the Citadel and the Compass Gnome and the Sunbird Standard, we could splash a little bit if we need to but that is going to be it for generic fixing. Then there's specific mana fixing like black, red, and blue, black with the other rare lands. So decent looking stuff there. Nothing super exciting though. So we'll take a look at all of our colors individually. Try to probably just pick the best two or three colors. Build a deck around that. Quick glance at the white. Love that we've got the double guide wing. The old tech cloud guard is also quite solid. That's about it. Obviously, we have the flanker here, but everything else is pretty filler in the color, including the removal. It's nice that we have a couple removal spells, but Cosmium Blast is on the more filler end of removal out of the color. For blue, not loving it here. Not a super high quantity of cards. I don't think the synergy's super high here either. 
We have some cards that care quite a bit about Descend, like the Overflowing Well and the Frilled Cave Worm, but not a ton of super powerful or super playable permanents to keep the permanent count high so that when we are milling ourselves with cards like the Everflowing Well, we're trying to hit a bunch of permanents that way. So my issue with that is that we have Brackish Blunder, Double Unlucky Drop for kind of our best pieces of interaction in the color, and they're all non-permanent spells. So that's kind of a nombo with our Descend cards like Everflowing Well and Song of Stupefaction, Frilled Cave Worm. And the Descend cards that we have aren't even that powerful, but they're still kind of the main thing going for the color. Yeah, not a huge fan of the blue. As for our black, looks like the mana curve is very consistent here. We also have solid, cheap removal between Deadweight and Tithing Blade. Every single card in the color is a permanent, so that is huge synergy towards Descend cards like Chupacabra Echo that want us to have as many permanents in our grave as possible. Black is looking like our best color so far, for sure. Just the pure quantity of cards here, having a few really top-tier playables like Deadweight, Chupacabra Echo, Tithing Blade being really solid, Deep Cavern Bat has played incredibly well. Lots of really, really good stuff going on for Black. It's, uh, it's just hitting a lot of things pretty well. It's got decent synergy, it has some cards that are just individually pretty high power, and it has a really good quantity of cards at various costs throughout the mana curve, so a lot of good stuff going on for black. And for red, this is probably the highest quantity of spells we've seen in any color. Let's check and see how that quality is here. We do have an Abrade and a Triumphant Chomp for cheap removal. We have a Dreadmaw's Ire that has played really well in this format with the amount of artifacts in the set. This can often be a two-for-one where you're going to use this to win combat against their creature, so you're going to blow up a creature with it, but then you're also going to trample over, get that damage ability to blow up an artifact, and you're going to blow up an artifact as well, so blowing up two things with one spell that only costs one mana is insane. If you can get into a position where you can do that with the spell, and I don't think that is tremendously hard to do in the format, so love me a Dreadmaw's Ire as well. We've got some good treasure production going on with a pickaxe, a plundering pirate if we want to do a little bit of fixing, or just to have extra permanence on the board that's pretty solid. We've got a rock slide if we need more removal. This one is our least efficient removal spell, but it can kill a big thing late in the game if we need to. And yeah, we've got creatures all throughout the curve. That's probably the weakest thing going on in the color. Um, there's no like really good creatures here. I like Plundering Pirate a lot and Wanderglyph a lot at their respective mana costs. Like a really solid 2-drop, a really solid 3-drop. Uh, Dinatomaton's pretty solid at 4 as well. But there's nothing like insane going on the creatures. None of these, I would say, is like really high quality. They're just a couple that are pretty solid at their mana cost, and everything else is pretty filler. Ooh, actually, I didn't notice the Yearling. Yearling's actually a really good 2-drop creature. But uh, yeah, that leaves us with one, two, three, four creatures that I really like at their mana costs. And then five that are just like, yeah, if we need more creatures, we can play a gnome, a blade master, a child, a strider, and a monstrosaur. So yeah, I think the, the creature's a little weaker than the spells, but still really good stuff going on in red. The last, but hopefully not least, we'll check out the green as a color couple stone tree for ramping into all of these really big six drops in the deck. So we have two poison dart frog and two stone tree. Kind of tempting for playing a ramp deck. That's four cards that can skip our way up the mana curve. Help us try to make it to six mana where we have three copies of Earthshaker Dreadmaw, which can hit the board and draw a card for each other dinosaur we control. Now the thing that's a little awkward about this is green and red are the colors with the most dinosaurs in the set, and the way that you really want to use Earthshaker Dreadmaw is to curve out with some 3 and 4 mana dinosaurs, maybe if you're lucky some 2 mana dinosaurs as well, but when you look at our dinosaur count, if we don't take into account all these 6 and 7 mana ones because we want to preferably curve out with these and then just slam down a Dreadmaw, we've got like 1, 2, 3. So there's three dinosaurs at cheaper than six mana for the Earthshaker Dreadmaw, so that's a little awkward. Now, if we still play a really slow and really grindy game, 
where we're trying to play a six or seven mana dinosaur and then play the Earthshaker Dreadmaw, things do get quite a bit more consistent. That's three more dinosaurs into the deck, but uh, obviously that is not the ideal way to play it. This format is relatively quick. I would say even in sealed, it's a bit of a slow game plan to be like, okay, so what I want to do is I want to resolve a couple six drop dinos then resolve another one that lets me draw cards because I played the other two. So Dreadmon, not quite as crazy as it could be if we had a better curve of dinos. If we just had one or two more kin collars and dinatomatons, I think I'd be pretty happy here. If we had the uh, green four mana dinosaur, that'd be really good as well. But it's still very interesting, still definitely something to keep our eyes on here. Because the other thing that's pretty cool about the green red dinos color pair is having the poison dart frogs and the stone tree. I guess that's just what's cool about green in general. Um, so that we just play two drops and three drops and hope to jump right up to six mana after that. Like, sure, we don't have a lot of four or five mana plays, but with all this mana ramp, hopefully, we're just jamming out the six drops a little early and playing some really, really big spells. So Green Red's a really cool deck to keep our eyes on, but we definitely want to look at some variations of decks that include black as well, because I think black is one of our best colors. So one last look at the colorless cards and the multicolored here real quick so I don't forget anything. Do you want to keep the belligerent in mind? Maybe that is worth a splash if we end up playing red because in red we have one, two, two treasure token providers immediately. And then if we play red green, we'll have two treasure tokens and two cards that add a man of any color. So maybe just playing like one um, one sunken citadel that we can put in as a blue source and a sunbird standard can get there. Maybe we don't even need to play an island at that point. So blue splash could be pretty easy for the belligerents. So yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind if we end up playing one of these two colors like if we play red we splash in the blue if we play blue we splash in the red although again looking at the quality of our colors i don't think we're really playing blue as the core color of this deck so let's start things off taking a peek at the black again i really like this color what do i think would synergize well with it we want a secondary color that has a lot of permanence that can make the best use of our chupacabra echo making that as consistent and powerful as possible I really wish we just had one or two pieces of graveyard recursion because that's where you can make the Chupacabra Echo super nuts where you play it, you kill an opposing creature, and then you pick it right back up from your grave after you trade it off or chump block with it to cast it again. That's where the Chupacabra Echo really pops off. And there are a few ways in black to have some graveyard recursion, but we just didn't open any uh in the sealed pool which is awkward i think our only graveyard recursion spell we opened was a walk with the ancestors which is really inefficient at five mana but to try to pay for that you do get to discover four so slight consideration towards green black because of the chupacabra echo recursion combo being so solid but i don't think our green looks like it synergizes all that well with the black I suppose we've got a lot of cheap black creatures. A lot of these are great at trading off and slowing the game down. Deep Cavern Bat rips our opponent's best card out of their hand until they kill our bat. So that slows our opponent down. Having a Death Toucher like a Marionette. Uh, having a card that trades off and provides us some creatures when it dies. That also can slow down combat. So I guess the black spells are pretty decent at just gumming up the board in the early game. So we use the black to grind out the game, and then once the game has been prolonged long enough for us to hit six or seven mana, just slamming down some big dinos. It's definitely a game plan. It's not, like, incredibly powerful. There's no super sick synergies or anything going on. It's just generic Magic the Gathering game plan synergies of, well, I slow the game down with these cards, so I can prolong it long enough to cast these, you know, <laughs> nothing. There's no like wombo combos anywhere here that make us feel like we're really doing anything that great. But it's definitely a playable color pair. What about black blue? That gives us access to some more descend cards with the ever flowing well trying to hit eight. It's also milling ourselves to make the Chupacabra more consistent. 
It's the cave worm as well. I feel like the chupacabra is probably strong enough. We don't really need to build around it that much. And that is the best descend card in the sealed pool. And yeah, our other blue cards are just not very exciting. I don't love the idea of the blue-black. Black-white lets us play a pretty aggressive curve with the double miner's guide wing and the Oltec cloud guard giving us a bunch of evasive threats to try to close out the game. It's pretty interesting. I think our removal is pretty mediocre in this deck. We're definitely not very good at killing like larger creatures with good abilities. Because Deadweight is our only removal spell that we can choose what we're targeting uh, if they don't attack with their creatures, right? Like if they jam out some creature with just a nuts ability and don't attack or block with it ever, Cosmium Blast isn't going to do anything. Um, and then Tithing Blade, of course, they choose what they sacrifice. And later in the game, they're going to have multiple creatures to choose from. So if our opponent resolves like a monster store, some kind of 6-6 six, six trample or 7-6 or something, this deck is very weak to it. I guess I've got a Death Toucher, but that could be a little bit of an issue. Not that any of our other decks I think are going to be any better at killing big creatures, because like we've got no green removal. Our red removal, the biggest one, is Rock Slide, which is dependent on the lands we have. Yeah, there is no deck in our sealed pool that's going to have a particularly good time against big creatures anyway. I guess blue would have the best time. We can at least unlucky drop them for a while. Yeah, no, I don't think that's much of a thing to consider here. I don't think any of the decks are going to be doing great against big creatures, except maybe just green plays bigger creatures, hopefully. <laughs> so there's that. All right, so I do like the, the black-white. I think that looks decent. I think the black-green looked fine as well. Black red, we have really good removal and a pretty aggressive curve by sealed standards. That is actually pretty spicy. So we'd have to cut nine cards here. So let me just scooch over my nine least favorites to the right. Creatures, non creatures, 20 to 12. Usually it's going to be around 17 to 6 for your average deck. 17 creatures and 6 non-creatures. Cut 6 non-creature spells out of here. 1, 2, 3. Maybe no pickaxe. I feel like that's our next weakest one. 2, 3, 4. Although Sahili's Lattice is basically a creature if we have a few dinosaurs in here to uh, craft with this later. And we do have a couple. I think it's literally a couple. Monster Store, Dinatomaton, Yearling. I guess that's three. And there's four if we keep the Spike Tail in. I feel like Sahili's Lattice is a good enough reason to keep the big land cycling dinos in the deck. Just gives them, gives them that extra bit of synergy to make them pretty worth playing. So if we don't have enough mana, we can land cycle them. And they're actually potentially doing something for us sitting in the grave. They're going to fuel Descend cards like Chupacabra Echo and fuel our craft cards like Sahili's Lattice that want to exile one from the grave. They fuel the Tithing Blade flip by having a creature in grave. I think they're actually pretty good in here. I like that idea. So yeah, is that the only non-creature that is up here for that count? I think it is. So... 12 minus 5, basically. So we're at 7 non-creatures. That's fine. We can just cut all creatures from now. So 5 more cards to cut. Skull Taker is not the most consistent, nor is the Hot Foot Gnome, the Blade Master. Mycoid Inquisitor. Child of the Volcano. Well, now I'm going to have to put some stuff back in. Um, I feel like I like Skull Taker better than all these. I definitely don't really like Vito's Inquisitors. She's really just been super unimpressive all format long for me. The Mycoid as well, those Fungus Tokens. There's a couple things you can do with them, but they have been just not a big enough payoff for running a, a 3 toughness 4 mana card. That doesn't just have an immediate like enter the battlefield effect or something for added value. 
I feel like this is what the red-black deck would look like. And this is my favorite so far. I mean, I am biased because we got into the arena open day two by playing a red-black deck in sealed. And this one doesn't have any rares. Like, it doesn't have any bombs. It doesn't have massive reasons to be in the color. But I really like the mana curve that it has going. And it has some pretty good descend synergies. Just graveyard synergies in general. Relatively high permanent count, so that Chupacabra Echo will be pretty powerful. But we also have the land cyclers that we can use to have descended to trigger cards like Deep Goblin Skull Taker, as well as to fill the grave for the Chupacabra Echo or the Sahili's Lattice. We also have the Volatile Wandering Lift to discard a card and draw a card. That can fill our grave with some creatures for the Chupacabra Echo. Uh, well, some permanents for the Chupacabra Echo or some creatures for the uh, Sahili's Lattice. So I like that Wanderglyph going on in here as well. We've got, yeah, just a really solid curve, just mana curve wise as well. Black Red, I think is my favorite of the black decks that we've looked at. Black Green probably does take second place, just because I do like the idea of grinding things out with these and then just ramping into big green spells. It's just a fun idea. Green doesn't give us any bombs or anything unless you just count 6-6 six, six tramplers as bombs, which, I mean, fair enough. Um, doesn't give us any rares or anything, though. I really like our black in the sealed pool. All right, so, so far, black-red is my favorite, but I did want to take a peek at that red-green dino synergy deck here and see how that looks. 13 cards to cut here as well. I think Explorer's Cache probably does make the cut. Uh, it's four cards out, nine more to go. Our uh, Sahili's Lattice gets really good in this deck with the amount of dinos that we have. This is really consistently going to be a two for one. It's going to be the uh, two mana discard a card, draw two, and the five mana, probably five four, um, which is pretty great. Pretty dang good. All right, these are all my favorite two drops. Blade Master is real bad in this deck. Probably not filling the grave a whole ton for the Scavenger. We've got a couple caves for the Stone Tree, so it can ramp us up and be an additional six mana five five later. So that's kind of spicy. Probably not having a ton of permanence for Strider in this pile. And we cut the veteran to just play actual dinosaurs at the top of the curve. There's actually not a ton of great synergy for Explorer's Cache here, just not a lot of plus and plus one counters being provided outside of the cache itself. Need to cut one more card here. Probably shouldn't play this many 6-7 mana cards, so we would probably cut one of the Dreadmaws. Uh, but I'll, just for the sake of putting it aside, put the Cavern Stomper aside. If I click on a Dreadmaw and cut it, then I can't click these buttons anymore to swap my colors around. Uh, so that's why I'm dragging everything rather than clicking on them to remove them. So this would be the 40 card deck in green-red. I mean, it's solid. Solid for sure. Keep that splash in mind, we can put the Belligerent in here. Um, but we can put the Belligerent in the Black-Red deck as well, and I think the Belligerent is much better in the Black-Red deck than this deck. The problem that we have with the Belligerent here, even if our mana is more consistent for it because we can cast it off of Poison Dart Frogs, the problem is it's much easier with this deck to get in a position where we crew it, we attack, and then we just see a Bristleback on top, or a Dreadmaw on top. Or a monster sore on top. Like we have a much more when it comes to top end spells, a lot less when it comes to those cheap spells that we might be able to loop and draw multiple cards off the belligerent with. So I think belligerent is significantly stronger in our red black deck than it would be in this green red deck. Um, maybe to the point where if we go green red, it, it's reasonable to not uh, splash it in, but I probably still would here um, since the man is pretty easy to do it when we have double dark frog. And uh, that one multicolored land, and maybe a treasure or two with a pickaxe and a plundering pirate. So that's a thing. But I think I'm just going black red. I think I'm going black red. It's close. 
Green red, green black, and black red are my favorite decks here. Just some combination of Jund, I think, is likely the best place to be. But see if we can't run it back. Go with another black red deck today. So back to cutting those weakest spells, and this time I am actually just going to fully cut them. Then do scooch that lattice up to five mana. Okay, and we do need to see how easy it is to shove the belligerent in here. The nice thing about this also, because we're black red instead of green red, we actually get to play all of our rare dual lands as well. So this is also the deck that plays the most rares that we have in the sealed pool. Sure, it's not like we're playing a ton of like just explosive bomb rares by being in this color pair and splashing in the blue red card, but it is playing, I think, almost every rare in the sealed pool, period even if they're not like traditional bombs. I mean, let's see. All right, we're playing four of the six rares. We're not playing the Everflowing Well or the Flanker here, but that's fine. I think we're playing the best four rares in this deck. So that's always a plus, always a plus here. So looking at the land to non-land ratio, we have 17 lands in the deck. That's probably where we want to keep it, right on that average number there. We're at 15 creatures and 10 non-creatures, but it's important to keep in mind if you have cards that are non-creatures that are consistently going to play like creatures, then you can have that towards your creature count as well. So Sahili's Lattice, I think, is probably consistent enough to consider this to be a 5-mana creature later in the game because we do have 4 dinosaurs in this deck and we have some good self-mill, some discard and draw to dig through enough of our deck that on average we will have seen a dinosaur by the time we play the lattice. So I think it can uh, it can do that consistently. And then, you know, worst case scenario, if I've only drawn one dinosaur and I've cast it, then we can just try to like trade it off aggressively so it ends up in the grave for the lattice. But that would be the one time where we don't actually get to just flip it turn five. If they like pacify one of our dinosaurs on board, then we can still flip it. If they blow up one of our dinosaurs, we can flip it from the grave. I guess if they end up exiling a dinosaur that we've ended up playing, that would be the most awkward scenario for the Sahili's Lattice to not flip. But I still think that's going to be decently consistent. So for removal here, we have a dead weight, a triumphant chomp for one mana removal spells. We've gotten a braid and a tithing blade at two mana, and we've got a rock slide at five. Feels pretty solid. If any of them were removal spells I might cut, it would be the Rumbling Rock Slide, but Sealed is a little bit more bomb heavy than Draft. The big issue that I tend to have with Rock Slide in Draft that I think will still be an issue in Sealed is the, the lack of mana efficiency and the fact that uh, there's a lot of creatures with really good just card advantage or value style enter the battlefield effects. So if your opponent drops their Water Wind Scout on turn three, gets their 2 2 flyer and their map token, and then you rock slide it on your turn four, you've spent a four mana removal spell to kill a three mana creature. So you're down in mana advantage, down in tempo a little bit there, and they still got value off that card. Whereas you've spent your entire card, they lost like 90% of what the Waterwind Scout is doing, but they still have that map token left behind that they can sacrifice for value later, either making a creature explore or like to craft something. So Rock Slide has been pretty awkward in draft, but sometimes you still just need a big removal spell for when your opponent drops a spooky bomb rare. And in Sealed, that's going to happen a little more often. Everyone has six rares to choose from at their disposal, whereas in Draft, sometimes you just don't even open any good rares, right? Your first two packs, you just get two bad rares, and then in your third pack, you get an off-color rare. Like, you're going to play against decks without bombs in Draft more consistently than in Sealed, because in Sealed, it's kind of hard to have six completely unplayable rares, and you're pretty much always going to build around your bombs if you've opened anything really explosive. So... I think I'm going to keep Rock Slide in and Sealed. If this were Draft, might be a different story. How consistent are we casting the Belligerent without the Diamond Pickaxe? It's another thing to consider here, because I'm feeling pretty happy with our current creature count here, 
at 15 creatures and a Sahili's Lattice. I like having a pretty aggressive, relatively high creature count. It's close to 17-ish as I can get. So this is basically uh, 16, 15 plus a Lattice, plus a Belligerent, but that's kind of more like an equipment than a, a creature. Because, yeah, it's going to be attacking like your creature, but only if we have another creature on the board. So don't really count vehicles in my creature count. Anyways, trying to keep this creature count high, trying to find non-creature spells to cut, hopefully. Can we cast a Belligerent consistently without the Pickaxe? We've got potentially an island in here, and a Restless Reef, and a Sunken Citadel. That'd be three natural blue sources. Well, Sunken Citadel, we might have to play as a red or black source sometimes. Um, we've still got one treasure token from a Plundering Pirate. But that's it. In black red, without the diamond pickaxe, we don't actually have non-land fixing. I mean, for a bomb that is still relevant pretty late into the game, the general rule of thumb is three sources for a one-pipped bomb like Belligerent. This is three sources even without the pirate's treasure. Which means on average we've got to be a third of the way through the deck to have a blue source. If we don't count that pillager... So around 13 or 14 cards in, that means we've drawn our initial 7, and then we've drawn another 6 cards. 6 or 7 cards, so turn 6 or turn 7 on average we'll have the blue source. Is Belligerent still pretty good turn 6 or 7? It is. Still think I'd like to hit it more consistently, at least a little bit ideally. I try to keep that pickaxe in here. The awkward thing is I don't really have any other non-creature spells I want to cut. Maybe I gotta drop a Rock Slide or Natali's Favor or something. I mean, Natali's Favor is one of these cards that can just roll you ahead on board, especially if you've got a pretty aggressive curve compared to your opponent's deck, which I think hopefully we will with the mana curve going on here. This just really helps you keep the pressure on. You're making your two drop big enough to compete with their three mana creatures, more likely than not, while still playing another creature for the turn. So it just jumps you ahead on board. I really like the favor. Again, Rock Slide, I, I like having a piece of removal for big creatures, but if I have to cut something here, it's like a Rock Slide or a Blade, or it's probably one of the removal spells. Maybe the Dreadmaw's Ire, because it's a little bit narrow, but it's so insanely explosive in the right position. I think it's worth keeping here. And maybe the creature count isn't so important that I want to keep mediocre creatures in here over Rumbling Rock Slide and Diamond Pickaxe style cards. Like, we definitely have some mediocre creatures in this deck that are just here to keep that count high, like Deep Goblin Skull Taker. I've got some synergies for this with the Wanderglyph, with the Land Cyclers, but it's still pretty, pretty inconsistent. Even if we can trigger this every single turn, it's not insane. It's a 3 mana for a card that's going to attack as a 3-3 three, three menace the first time, then maybe a 4-4 four, four menace the next turn, maybe a 5-5 five, five menace after that. But it's not going to be nearly that consistent. And again, even when it is, all it takes is one removal spell, and you have completely blanked the card. It hasn't gotten you any value. Unlike a lot of other creatures in the set, where, well, this has gotten us some treasure tokens, this has letting us draw on some cards, uh, this had an enter the battlefield effect, a bunch of stuff like that. I think Skull Taker's probably our most mediocre creature. Um, but maybe Death Cap Marionette or Echo of Dusk are like our most mediocre two drops. Or even the Skull Cap Snail, like, it gives you one for one value when it hits the board. Like, you've spent one spell to make them exile one spell. That's a one for one immediately. So anything you get out of the 1-1 one, one body is, is fine. It's just gravy. But the snail's played a little weaker than it has in a lot of other formats. Just because that, uh, the tempo loss of playing a 1-1 one, one for two mana hasn't been, hasn't been great with the speed of the format. That also feels a little more like a draft kind of thing than a sealed thing. This is probably still pretty good in sealed. I don't think... You know, things are nearly as blisteringly fast in uh, in the wrong matchups here. But when we're trying to make things go pretty fast and we're trying to be the aggro player, the fact that this is a 1-1 means it doesn't really help us attack that much as compared to uh, an Echo of Dusk or Skull Taker, if these are other cards that are on the, uh, on the chopping block here. But Marionette has the same problem being a 1-1. 
Of course, having death touch means it still trades into anything on blocks, so functions much better than your average 1 1 on blocks, but still on attacks, it's doing one damage. I like that the marionette helps the chupacabra echo. I don't think we have anything in our deck that is just a complete game ender if we mill it either, so I think marionette's still good here. Um, because it helps the Chupacabra Echo. It also helps the Sahili's Lattice, potentially, if we don't mill, mill the Lattice or mill the Echo. Um, but if we mill other cards, then that'll help those things out. And I guess they help the Echo of Dusk as well, and that lets me keep the curve pretty aggressive here. kind of want to cut the uh, Skull Taker and maybe the Rock Slide here. Because this is also cutting another non-permanent. Not that it matters too much when the only card that cares about permanence specifically is the Echo. But I did already speak my gigantic piece about why Rock Slide is probably the weakest removal spell we have for the mana cost. We gotta cut something. I guess we technically don't have to. You can play a 60 card deck, but ideally you always want to play a 40 card deck to make your deck as consistent as possible. You want to find out what the 24th best card in your deck is, or the number one worst card in your deck is. Uh, that way, you are more consistently drawing slightly better cards. You always want to be at 40 cards exactly. But I guess if you're in positions like this, where you really don't know, and you cut the objectively wrong card, then maybe it is better to just play 41 cards. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to drop the rock slide. I'm going to see how that works out for us. We can make some adjustments to this deck as the games go on, but I'm going to start in with that skull cap snail, try that bad boy out, and we will call it a deck here. And I guess I should mention before we get into the deck overview that uh, I guess cutting a land was an option here as well, going to 16 lands, but our average mana curve is a little high, probably higher than it says because we do have these two that we can land cycle when we need to. I don't really want to cut a land here when I think this deck's already pretty resilient to flood. We have two lands we can just start beating down with if we're flooding out, and a land we can sacrifice to discover, as well as some ways to discard a land to draw other cards late game, like discarding a land to a Wanderglyph or a Sahili's Lattice. So I think this deck is reasonably solid at uh, dealing with flooded situations to where I'm just going to keep the 17 in. Uh, to more consistently hit the man all the way up the curve without having to like discard non lands to draw lands or anything in the early game. I think I want to, yeah, keep it at 17 here. All right, here's a look at the final deck list for today. We're on a black red mid range deck with definitely a more aggressive leaning from our sealed pool. We've got a very good curve of creatures with a ton of stuff to roll out on turn two to get that ball rolling and just follow it up with creatures throughout the curve from there. So really solid mana curve to just keep the game going, getting a bunch of power onto the board and trying to beat our opponent down before they resolve anything too scary. But as they are playing blockers and trying to stop our early onslaught, we've got tons of cheap removal and interaction with a dead weight and a braid, a tithing blade and a triumphant chomp. We've also got a Dreadmaw's Ire to trample over one of their blockers and potentially blow up one of their artifacts and this color pair with a blue splash lets us play the majority of rares in our sealed pool. We're splashing in the Belligerent as a really nice card draw engine, as well as a pretty big vehicle. And we're splashing that in with the help of the other rares in the sealed pool. The Restless Reef for a blue source, the Sunken Citadel for a source of any color, and a Restless Vents for just an on-color dual land as well. So we opened up three rare lands, but we'll work with it. We'll play them all and, uh, and use them to our best ability today. So that is going to be the deck. Without further ado, let's head into the gameplay and see how it does. Here we are now for game one. Our opponent is on the play. Got one mana removal to interact with them, so don't feel that bad about this keep. It's definitely a slower hand, but it's got great late game with multiple man lands. We can turn into creatures late in the game, a cheap removal spell. I think we keep this. Now we do draw into the belligerent yearling, so by getting our red tap land out of the way right now, we can drop that down on turn two. There's an inverted iceberg from our opponent. Mill one and draw a card. We do draw into the mountain. 
Yes, we've got quite a few red spells in the hand, so we'd like to have two red sources on the board to be able to cast two of these in one turn later. So let's get the red source out of the way so I can play the Restless Reef next turn and not feel bad. Although I could Atali's Favor. I think it's going to be a little stronger to have access to Dinatomaton turn four than it is to have access to Favor turn three. Maybe not. I mean, Favor on average hits like another 2-2. Two -two. So this is three power and toughness with Trample this turn, this early in the game. I guess since they have two mana up, because they have mana up, I think I'm just going to play the tap land and play the Dinatomaton next turn. They didn't have mana up here. Probably would go for the Atali's favor. Just don't want to cast this and have them have the uh, Brackish Blunder in response to counter my Atali's favor and bounce my yearling. That would be really bad. Brackish Blunder is the common instance in blue in the format. It's one in a blue to bounce a creature. And if the creature's tapped, you get a map token. So that would be really bad for me if they had that. And I tried to Atali's favor. So our deck is not particularly good against flyers. So I think we might go Triumphant Chomp and cast the favor this turn. Deciding whether or not I want a Spike Tail here on four mana total, I need to draw two more lands before I can cast this thing. And by discarding the Spike Tail, I put a permanent engrave for Chupacabra Echo, which is definitely spicy. I think I do ditch the Spike Tail here. Make sure I hit lands consistently to cast other spells. Cast two spells in one turn more consistently. And then we're closer to Chupacabra Echo actually killing something when we play it. Drew into an Abrade, which I like quite a bit. We're not going to cast that this turn, because I can't cast that and Atali's favor, but I can definitely cast Chomp in favor. So let's Chomp the Guard, favor the Yearling, and just get jamming in. Hit a Tithing Blade. Well, I mean, it's not going to be any better than it is now. If I reveal a Tithing Blade to my opponent, they're not going to craft anything with their 1-1 Gnome. Or they're not going to chump block with their 1-1 Gnome. They'll just make sure they still have that on board for when I do cast the Tithing Blade later. So, not the best discover, but it's definitely not the worst one. We do have our combat trick that we can only cast on attacking creatures. That would be the worst spell to discover in our deck. So our opponent has an Oltec Archaeologist here for a 4-4 that lets them scry 3. Decent blocker for the Yearling. We'll trade off if we send in, but I've got that Dinatomaton to give Menace if we want to. There is an argument for not casting Dinatomaton. Because the trade's probably okay for us, right? Because if we take the trade, then we have 3 permanents in our graveyard for Chupacabra Echo. So it does juice that thing up. But I'm pretty happy to just be getting damage in here. Our alternate line is to like play a deep cavern bat and hold up in a braid. Or just play the Diamond Automaton post combat. Just cause. I mean I guess I could activate one of these lands and attack with that alongside the yearling. Instead. This one can mill me four to really activate the Chupacabra Echo. But no, let's just keep the pressure on. Let's just get the damage in here. Oh, and it gets base power? Base power equal to the power? Oh yeah, so we will be doing 5 instead of uh, 4 here, so that's another little advantage to the pre-combat Dinatomaton. I guess if we really wanted to offer the trade with the Archaeologists, we could have played this pre-combat and had it target itself, so that the Yearling wouldn't have Menace, but also we'd be able to trample over for 1 damage if they did take the block, so that would be pretty cute. Uh, so Chupacabra Echo, already good enough to kill the bat. I think I want to just play Deep Cavern Bats. Uh, that's still holding up double black thanks to our dual lands. So yeah, let's play... Let's play the Deep Cavern Bat. I want to see what's going on in their hand before I make any more decisions here. If I have a card that can give me that information, I'm going to get it. Alright, Unlucky Drop. Very happy to see that being cast right now, so it doesn't randomly stop me from getting lethal and really ruin my turn. I will keep Dinatomaton. Being able to give something Menace again next turn should be pretty good. And there's a helping hand. Alright, so literally just a land in hand, so next turn they're probably just going to make a 6-6. Six, six. Oh, they can't! They have no other artifact on board. They can't craft this thing. No artifact on board or engraved, so next turn they're just going to spin the wheel. 
either they top deck something and cast it, or they discover something and cast it. Either way, it's pure variance, pure randomness what they're going to be doing. So, I don't think I hold the Chupacabra Echo then. I think I just kill the Lifelinker and get some damage in here. I mean, probably trade, but get ready to get some damage in next turn because they've got nothing. They're going to be spinning the wheel, rolling that slot machine, and seeing what they get. So let's find out. Just another little 1-1. One -one. Pretty happy to see that. I've gotten a braid if I need to. Really doesn't feel necessary, but I suppose I could lethal them. No, I'm one mana off from lethal. So I need four mana to activate this, which I have. One, two, three, four. Then it's active. Then I still have two lands untapped, but I'd have to use those two to braid the guide wing, which would then mean that the Restless Reef would be tapped and not attacking, so it wouldn't be eight damage. Oh, and they actually drew a spell, too, so it's definitely not lethal then. However, a braid on Duskrow's Reliquary is about to be filthy. Yeah, it's one, when it enters the battlefield, regardless of if we cast it or not, Oh yeah, well, this turn's gross. No Dynatomaton because of the ward, but this still feels like a really nice use of our mana, and they're just going to concede on the spot. Fair enough. We're going to start things off 1-0 as we head into game number two. All right, here we are for game number two. Got all of our colors, which is pretty great. Four lander's a little bit high, like just a tiny, tiny bit, but certainly still very keepable. Removal spell, hand interaction, favor to put on the bat. Super reasonable start. Perfectly fine with this hand. Get our black source out turn one, so it's untapped when we play the bat turn two. Drawn to a marionette, so we do have another creature to play. Sadly, it's a 1-1, so not the greatest creature in the world, but... Alright, a bunch of cheap creatures that are also too big to die to Triumphant Chomp. That's pretty scary. And then a 5-mana removal spell. I mean... If I just Atali's favor my life linker, they have nothing to block it for a while, so that's going to single-handedly race for quite some time. So maybe I do just ditch the Ray of Ruin... I'll have a Death Cap Marionette trade with one of these little creatures. I think I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to race with a 2-2 Flying Lifelinker for a while. We'll certainly want to keep that Fungal Fortitude in mind when they have two mana up. Well, now I kind of want to play Necromage over Atali's Favor. Although Necromage doesn't even attack into the Brontodon if they play that one. So Necromage is probably just going to be on blocks anyway. Yeah, let's actually uh, Atali's favor here. They have no response in hand. I mean, they could put a Fortitude onto our Deep Cavern Bat. So unless they top decked removal here, this is a perfectly safe play. Ooh, that's actually pretty good against their hand. I don't mind the Tithing Blade. All of their creatures are just full-on spells. Like, they're going to cast a 3-drop and then we'll Tithing Blade it. Unless they just hold off until they have 5 mana to play a creature and put a Fortitude on it, this is just gonna kill a creature. Gonna kill an actual spell. They have no creature tokens in hand. Screaming Phantom. Alright. And now, we get to have a really good turn where we can Triumphant Chomp the Screaming Phantom to get it out of the way so we can keep the Tithing Blade for their next creature. So I can also just resolve a threat on the ground this turn to beat down with. Because next turn they'll have four mana up, enough to play a Brontodon or an Aquawali or a Pathfinding Axe Draw, but not enough to play one and Fortitude it. So we just Tithing Blade and hit for five. And yeah, they didn't even hit a land, so they're just going to Swamp Cycle a Spike Tail from their hand, which means they don't play any creatures unless they drew a two drop. Ooh, wow. That's actually a very good creature to have drawn against the Tithing Blade, because now our Tithing Blade just kills a 1-1, one, one, and they make us get rid of a card in our hand. Mm. I mean, I could just attack both, and they still just don't block here, which is kind of cute. I feel like I need to ditch the Yearling. 
feel like I need to ditch the Yearling, because Marionette's going to be a great blocker against any of these creatures, whereas Yearling's not going to be a good attacker against the 3-4, or this one if it turns into a 5-4. Yeah, like, Marionette's guaranteed to be a good blocker. Yearling might be a good attacker. It's not a guarantee. Now let's get rid of the Yearling. I guess I could also get rid of the Tithing Blade so I don't have to use it on a snail, but if I draw Dreadmaw's Ire, then uh, I am more than happy. Oh, wow. And they just take the block? I... I mean, they're green-black, and they have no artifacts in hand. It's not particularly likely I'm going to get anything better done with this Dreadmaw's Ire, so yeah, let's trample over so we can keep our 3-1 around to attack after I Tithing Blade the next creature. And I guess Tithing Blade's a sorcery, so we do play the Marionettes. Get some uh, Descend Fuel in there. And Fortitude brings their creature back tapped, so now even if they, yeah, even if they do the game plan of play a 3-drop hold up a Fortitude, I still stop them from blocking this turn, and then I have a Tithing Blade to flip on them to start draining them for life. Which, worst case scenario, ends up killing their Brontodon, which is still not bad at all. Okay, so I could, like, crew the Restless Reef and attack with this. Then they trade their take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Or I can just Tithing Blade and make them take 7. I'm just gonna Tithing Blade. I think either plays super fine. Same damage either way, really. I guess this is 6 instead of 7. But gets that Fortitude out of the way, and now Tithing Blade's on the board, ready to get flipped next turn to start draining them for life. It makes them lose a life every turn, which is really good when they're down to four. Again, they've got a Brontodon they can sacrifice to blow this thing up, but if they sacrifice a Brontodon to blow this up, that's one less creature they've got. For blocks. They still have no way to deal with a Flyer, so they're just going to mill that Pathfinding Axe draw they found off the Explorer. And they're just two swings from dying to a deep cavern bat. They're actually just dead to our land right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm just going to activate the land and attack. I don't think there's anything for one green mana that saves them. And they do go ahead and concede for us. So that is going to be 2 and 0 oh now. Guaranteed a solid sum of gems from our play-in points. Pretty happy with how things are going so far. This is an event that you're out after only two losses. Instead of the normal seven wins or three losses, it's six wins or two losses. So definitely a bit harder to win than an arena open day one or just a regular sealed event since you've got less room for error. Um, but that does mean that at two wins, our worst case scenario out of this event is a 50-50 record. So solid stuff to start it off. We'll see if we can't keep it up as we head into game three. Here we are for game three, definitely one of those awkward hands where we have to use one of our splash lands, the Sunken Citadel, for one of our main colors. We're going to have to play that as a black source to guarantee the turn to Deep Cavern Bat, but I think the hand is still pretty reasonable. It can get steamrolled because it just has 1-1s one until turn five, but I think the cards are individually good enough, especially Deep Cavern Bat, to pick their best spell and remove it from their hand for a while. I think it's pretty reasonable. Ooh, that was a very good draw. Restless Vents means that's going to be our turn one tapped land. So we can de delay the decision on the Sunken Citadel and see if we can actually play that as a blue source later. Opponent drops Vanguard of the Rose. That kind of makes me want to play the Skullcap Snail instead so I can threaten to block that. Because if I play a Deep Cavern Bat, I'm not going to be attempting to block Vanguard of the Rose because I'm just going to give them back the card that I exiled. By playing a Skullcap Snail, I get immediate one-for-one one value. I played my spell, I removed one of theirs, and I threatened to block the Vanguard and keep this three damage off my face if they don't play something super expendable to sacrifice to it. I think Snail just became much better. Yeah, and if it gets rid of a Tithing Blade, it gets rid of a Tithing Blade. I will certainly take that. If they didn't play a Vanguard of the Rose, that means I would have played a Deep Cavern Bat, seen a Tithing Blade in their hand, and had to just remove a Tithing Blade, because otherwise they make... They make me sack the bat, and they get their card back no matter what. So that was a pretty good turn of events for us. Here, we can only play a two-mana spell. I could Lattice discard the Dino draw to, but I'm one man away from playing it, so I'm probably just going to play a four-mana 4-3 four, next turn. So we just play the tap land on blue, because we've got triple red and double black already. Play the bats. Yep, seems good to me. 
Taking some hits from the Vanguard, unfortunately. Old Tech Cloud Guard and a Helping Hand. All right, well, get rid of the Cloud Guard and they have just nothing left to do now. They have to top deck into some plays. Or we just start dropping more spells than they've got. Now, there is this little problem of this Vanguard of the Rose, but that'll stop being a problem once I have five mana and we just drop a five toughness blocker. So, yeah, pretty happy here. I guess if they top decked the four damage to an attacker or blocker, that could be pretty bad for me. But it would have had to been just a draw off the top. So, we still attack there. I mean, I could have given the Bat Menace pre-combat, but there's no instant speed flying creature in the format. As far as I remember, there's like one rare flash creature in black and white, and it's it's on the ground. Oh wow, they don't attack against the Dinotomaton? I would have expected the attack there, since they can just sack the Tithing Blade anyway. But I guess they want to hold off on blocks? I mean, this has Menace, so they're not really blocking either. I don't know. I'm pretty happy with this turn of events. All right, they're down to 14, and we just keep the plays coming. Started this game with a large amount of card advantage thanks to two different spells exiling a card of their, out of their hand. And the fact that they used removal on the Skullcap Snail means this did graduate all the way up into a full-on two-for-one. We exiled the spell from their hand and made them spend a removal spell. So Skullcap Snail did some real good work, as the Deep Cavern Bat is doing as well. Yeah, I mean, things are still looking pretty awesome for us. We just play a Sahili's Lattice, discard the Mountain to draw two. And whenever Dinatomaton dies, we can flip this as well. Later in the game, which is pretty nice. Find an Atali's Favor and a Triumphant Chomp. Don't feel a massive need to chomp the 3-1 here. They've only got one card in their hand that we don't know about. I guess we find out if it's instant speed removal by slapping an Atali's favor onto one of these cards. I think I put it on anything except the bat, because if I try to put it on the bat and they have instant speed removal, they get their cloud guard back and counter the favor, which counters the discover, which is really bad. So let's just put it on the strider, make this real juicy. I probably shouldn't have let Auto Tapper do things. But Triumphant Chomps is sorcery, so the odds of us wanting to cast that are pretty astronomically low anyway. Um, buff the Lifelinker, I guess. Might as well. Don't really need to hold anything up on blocks, especially if we get to gain three. But even then, I mean, 16 life, even if I didn't gain any life off this attack, I'd be perfectly happy with uh, not holding up blockers. Okay, opponent takes it all, they're down to three, and last ditch effort here, last hurrah. We'll see what they've got. Just one removal spell, quicksand whirlpool, not going to be enough to get them out of this, so they are just going to concede the game there. Really nice stuff, that game. This game really showing off the power of the little card disadvantage plays of Deep Cavern Bats and the Skullcap Snail while also showing off some of the flaws of cards like Helping Hand, where it's like really good in the right position. The problem is you do have to account for the times where it is bad, like this one, where it was basically just a mulligan for my opponent. They kind of just started down another card in a game when we were also ripping other cards out of their hands. So that put them at a huge card disadvantage, being down just that one extra card by having a card in their hand that just doesn't do anything, so... Rough, rough, rough spot for our opponent there. Definitely not the scenario you want to draw a helping hand. Really solid stuff for us, though, and it leads us into game number four, currently 3-0, and oh, undefeated so far. Here we are now for game four. Opponent is going to start on the play. We've got our excellent lands at the ready again for really good mana here. The mana's not perfect. With four red spells in the hand, we can definitely find ourselves in a position where turn three we want to play a Wanderglyph and a Chomp in the same turn, and we can't, but the mana's still very, very much worth a keep. The hand is still really nice. And, you know, ask and you shall receive. Now we have the double red, so we can cast one of these two drops and a burn spell in the same turn on turn three with a Chomp, or turn four with an Abrade if we need to. 
So our opponent starts with Oak and Siren. I'm a little tempted to kill that immediately to slow down our opponent that's on the play when they could be getting extra man out of this, playing four mana worth of spells. Like if they have like a seven Oak and Siren deck, that's not really going to happen in Sealed. But if they've got a good like four mana artifact here, I think with Yearling in the hand, we still just get aggressive here. I'm going to play the next red source. I'm going to drop the Yearling. Next turn, I'll tromp this Oak and Siren, but a Braid should be really good in this matchup, where this can potentially blow up like a 6-6 six, six in the late game if they flip an inverted Iceberg into the 6-6 six, six Titan. So I'm going to keep the Abraid for something else and use the Tromp on the Siren. Feels right to me. And that also lets us play a Creature plus Tromp next turn, which is really good. All right, so there is an attack with Oak and Siren. They have double blue up. So what I don't like here, what is a little awkward, is with double blue up, they can have a Cogwork Wrestler. And Cogwork Wrestler can make Yearling just a one power creature. If they do that, Triumphant Chomp will go back to just dealing two damage instead of three damage, and it won't actually kill the Oak and Siren. So do I play around a Cogwork Wrestler, and just a Braid this Oak and Siren. I've got an idea here. I've got an idea here. If my opponent wants to do Cogwork Wrestler shenanigans, what if I make them do it during combat? If I can get an attack in and they don't do anything here, they definitely don't have Cogwork Wrestler in hand, because they would have absolutely played it and double blocked with two one twos. And then by testing the waters with that, I can now know that my Chomp will... Well, I mean, not know, but I know that they don't have Cogwork Wrestler to stop the Chomp, which means that I can get the Chomp and the Wanderglyph down. And because I had the Abraid in hand, the attack was safe to where if they did Cogwork Wrestler and double block, I could spend an Abraid on a 1-2. Not that that's going to be really good for me, but the fact that it gives me the really guaranteed... Um, Knowing that I can chomp without getting Cogwork wrestler I think it was worth it. Alright, now we can just abrade this Larcenist. This is Ward 1, right? Thank god. Alright, Ward 1. If it was Ward 2, I'd be very sad. But Ward 1 means I can afford it while still playing my tap land for the turn, so let's kill that immediately so I can attack with the Wanderglyph for the turn. They're down to two cards here. Our position's looking pretty dang good. Especially when we've got another two-for-one coming up with a Chupacabra Echo eventually. Yep, I'm going to shoot that Larcenist. I'm going to pay with my land and not my treasure, because my treasure is going to be a creature again. And then, I guess I discard the Pickaxe at this point. Our mana's perfect with the Restless Reef here. Keep a Flyer, keep an Echo. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to discard something. So I could just keep all these, but I don't think Pickaxe is going to be insane on this board, so I'll just ditch it. Ooh, now a Hidden Volcano. Probably the best land we could have drawn at this point. We already drew the, the creature lands. The lands we can animate and beat down with, so... Alright, Chupacabra Echo is going to need one more mana to kill the Abuelo. We need one more permanent in our grave as well, but that's really easy with the Wanderglyph on board. So... I want to make sure I have six lands. Hmm. Does that mean I discard the Screaming Phantom? I don't think so. Because that would mean I just don't cast anything this turn. I guess I discard nothing, because we want lands, we want the Echo, and we want the Phantom. So discard nothing, attack with the Wanderglyph for this turn. Play the tap land and the Screaming Phantom, and next turn I can go land Chupacabra Echo. Now, we're going to Chupacabra Echo post-combat if they don't blow up any of my cards, because I do need one more permanent in my grave to give minus two, minus two. But uh, if we draw any permanent in our deck, we'll discard that to draw a card so I can Echo. Plus, maybe getting an attack in with the Phantom will do it. Ah, oh, well, never mind. Deconstruction Hammer means we need two more permanents in grave to kill a Boilo. But I'm still a pretty big fan of our position. We can just spend some time beating down with our lands. Or we could top deck Atali's favor. Do that instead. So I can either discover four. I can attack with a 4-4 four, four and mill myself four, so Echo's ready next turn guaranteed. Or I can Atali's favor on a Phantom or a Wanderglyph to beat down. 
I kind of like attacking with Restless Reef and just milling myself a bunch. That feels pretty good. Um, do I play my land still if I do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to need six mana down next turn. And if they play, like, another good creature, then that would lead to Echo plus Favor if I top deck another land for seven mana. Yeah, I think I play the land here, and I just send in the Restless Reef. Oh, I don't actually have another blue source. Shoot. Dang, so I can't actually do that. I can do the Restless Vents. That's just discard a card, draw a card. It's a menace threat, so it does hit them. I guess at that point, though, I just go for the Atali's favor. Shoot. Well, since I have nothing I want to discard, we just attack with Screaming Phantom then instead. Oh, hello there. Um, I mean, sure. I guess I could have just drawn that. That would have been reasonable just put in my hand. But by putting it on board, I get to attack with both still. I guess I could just kill something else with Chupacabra Echo. Now that Abuelo is just a 1-1. Alright, awkward turn. We definitely need to keep in mind we need another blue source to use the Restless Reef. But we didn't stumble that hard. I think that just means we probably... I mean, we still wouldn't want to discard the land because we need six mana to use the Chupacabra Echo. Yeah, that was still a fine turn. It just looked really awkward. It was <laughs> not the right, like, sequencing or the right, like, way to do things, but the things that we did were still perfectly fine. They were still some of the options that we were considering doing at the start of the turn. Not bad. Not terrible. Okay, seventh land is definitely redundant. I mean, they're forced into a chump here if we just do this. Ditch a land, draw a card. I like the Necromage. I'll keep that. Take it? I guess I'm one damage off. They're not forced to chump. But they are at one life. If they sack their decommission hammer, then Abuelo dies. Even if they target the dead weight, this is going to get sacrificed when the ability is put on the stack. Uh, they're dead on board. It cannot block three creatures, even if one did not have menace. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that was actually pretty favorable about the dead weight there that uh, I am just noticing here that's really nice, kind of spicy is that Abuelo's only still alive because it has the Deconstruction Hammer on it. Not Decommission Hammer. I always get that mixed up. So they can't move the Deconstruction Hammer, and they can't sack the Deconstruction Hammer. It's just stuck on Abuelo unless they want Abuelo to die. So that was kind of cute with the dead weight. Yeah. I think actually just casting the discovered dead weight on the Abuelo was definitely the right decision off the uh, Atali's favor discover there. But it was a pretty lucky discover overall. Just really solid stuff that game from the deck. We are now 4-0 and oh as we head into game number 5. Here we are on the play for game 5 with a really nice hand. We can Swamp Cycle the Spike Tail to keep hitting mana, getting towards 5 for the Lattice. And then no matter what we discard to the Lattice, we can flip it, making it a 5-4 by exiling the Spike Tail from Grave. Being on the play here is really nice. We've got two cheap removal spells and one little beat stick to get rolling with, and now we even have a Dreadmaw's Ire to just trample over one of their threats, especially if they resolve an artifact that'll be really spicy. Well, MT is a very, very big bomb. Obviously, it doesn't look like your traditional bomb, where it has, like, uh, just a super explosive ability the second it hits the board, but it takes over the, the game with that card advantage, those plus and plus on counters, all that kind of stuff. So we still need to just kill that with a chomp or a dead weight. I'm going to use the dead weight. Chomp could theoretically kill bigger things later. We've got a lattice in hand that can flip into a 5-4 um, once we have Swamp Cycle the Spike Tail. So uh, chomp could be bigger than dead weight later in the game, so I'm going to keep it. So now we can just chomp the scout, hit for two. Could also just slam down a necromage for now. 
which also seems pretty fine. I can let them hit me with scout. The issue would be if they use the map token on the scout and it becomes a 3-3 then I can't kill it with Tromp anymore, not till later in the game. So we use the spike tail and the Tromp or we necromage. Might not work out for me, but I'm going to play the Necromage here. With a Dreadmaw's Ire in hand, we can get some really nasty Necromage attacks in. With plus two, plus two Trample, five, three Trample sending in. Tempted to just push damage here. There's an Atali's Favor. All our removal is Sorcery Speed, so kind of stop that anyway. And their Discover isn't even good. It's a Cogwork Wrestler, so we're fine. Lucky stuff there. Them discovering into just a one drop. Well, there's a dead weight, which is pretty good here. And now, time for a pretty gross Dreadmaw's Ire. So, slightly grosser if they do block, but it's almost the same thing if they don't. So, kill the Wrestler and the map token. If they didn't block, I'd probably still do it and just kill the Wrestler. Okay. So... I mean, at this point, I could just Sahili's Lattice discard the Spike Tail instead of Swamp Cycling it. I just need to draw one land in the next three draws to flip the Lattice next turn. I think that's pretty fine. And there's the one land. So we can flip Lattice next turn as a 5-4 on the ground... Just keep attacking in there, and then I have a big enough dino to chomp away the Waterwind Scout out of the sky. Need to draw blue source now, which is awkward. I mean, I guess I don't need to draw it. I've got plenty of playables for now, but I will in a few turns run out of things to do. Alright, they're probably killing this thing. I really hope they don't, so I can still chomp the Waterwind Scout. But if they don't want to trade with the Necromage, then they've probably got removal for this. Maybe in a braid destroy an artifact here. Be pretty gross. Yeah, that's disgusting. That's some card quality there, Lord. Oh my god, and now the mythic Sahili. Now we have to chomp a Sahili. Which is fine, because. I no longer have a dino to be able to chomp the Waterwind Scout anyway. Might be dying to a Waterwind Scout now. But on the plus side, if we had went for a Waterwind Scout with the Triumphant Chomp early instead of the Necromage, we would have ended up dying to Sahili because I'd be out of removal for her. For those who don't know, Sahili makes duplicates of any creature artifact they control every turn so they can get like infinite chump blocks well infinite trade blocks even while getting treasure tokens and map tokens while they do it or they can just da jam in for a bunch of damage instead all right i think i have to hold off now at 10 life or at 8 life to 10 what are we exile sahili's lattice bear more removal and it's exile so we don't get the fungus tokens to crew the belligerent it's pretty bad pretty bad for us we're at two life now and they scry to the top i think and it's a land so we have nothing now yep we chump block a pirate and die rough well i guess we can see what our opponent scry to the top but we're incredibly dead oh we don't even get to see all right I might be wrong, they might have scryed to the bottom. All right, unfortunate stuff there. Just hit slightly too many lands. I think that's about as good as we could have played it there. I mean, I could have uh, chomped the Waterwind Scout. Obviously, that would have stopped quite a bit of damage, but then the Sahili starts taking things over. Maybe a chomp on the, uh, on the Waterwind Scout before they go for that Atali's favor. Changes the course of that game enough for us to have a better shot. I don't know if it wins it. 
So then they end up with a Saheeli we don't have interaction for, but it might buy us the time we need to potentially get just like one attack out of the belligerent. Could be enough to, to flip the game depending on what's on top of our deck, so maybe was a little greedy just going for insta damage with the 3-1 instead of going for the chomp. So much more mana efficient play, more aggressive. I think there's a lot of things going for that, but maybe just playing it safe against the flyer was the place to be. Definitely in hindsight, but with the information we had there, I don't know. Certainly a debatable one. Outside of that, I mean, just really high quality stuff from our opponent, and they had a little more gas than us. Just uh, a little more action. Four and one it is as we head into game six. Here we are now for game number six. We've got a turn two deep cavern bat to see what is going on in their hand and then tons of interaction a tithing blade and a braid and a chupacabra echo i will keep this it's definitely not aggressive but it is strong now we've got a necromage for turn three and onward sunshot militia will be the first play from our opponents don't hate tithing blading that thing, but it doesn't do much till later in the game anyway. Let's see what's going on in their hand. Maybe if their hand's weak enough, we end up abrading the militia so that tithing blade kills something better, because they are green-red, where they could have some real big dinos we might be able to tithing blade. All right, four drop, four drop, four drop. I don't really know what I want to hit here. I mean, a braid is big enough to kill... Dinatomaton always, and Axtroff, it doesn't explore. Maybe I just get rid of the Seed Stones? Because it is a two for one. It's going to give them a bunch of plus one, plus one counters, and then also flip into a seven, seven later. It's the slowest of the cards, though. They probably cast these two first. But I've got reasonable responses to them with a Braden Echo. I think I'm going to ditch the Seed Stones, weirdly enough. So it does look like we're gonna Tithing Blade the Militia. Or Necromage it, honestly. Just let it chill for now. We can Necromage it up here. Tithing Blade can still kill Militia on any turn based on what they have in their hand. They're just gonna play creatures that are bigger than Militia. They're still just gonna sack Militia to it whether I play Tithing Blade turn 2 or turn 7 at this rate. Another Dinatomaton coming up, so a lot of menace threats, and very unfortunately means a non-land on top. Opponent wins that coin flip pretty hard, and this is 4 toughness out of range of a braid. It's quite bad for me. So Chupacabra Echo in hand. Definitely want to ditch some permanents here. If I play a Skullcap Snail, it's a one-for-one one immediately, then I can double block the Axe Draw with Necromage and Snail, and that basically just feels like a one-for-one one block for us. And then that puts more permanence in Grave to really get that Chupacabra Echo active. I think that's very reasonable. And then I can Tithing a Blade away... No, I don't have double black, never mind. Can't Tithing Blade the way... away the Militia. I can hold up in a Braid... We're not attacked with Necromage, that would be a bad idea. What did we exile? Mountain. Alright, so they did draw an extra land to ditch. I guess for mana efficiency we can abrade the Militia and then Tithing Blade hit something bigger. It's gonna be like the same thing either way. I abrade a bigger card and then Tithing Blade the Militia, or I'm Tithing Blade the Militia and then abrade a bigger card. So we should probably just get mana efficient with it. Although at this rate, I can just abrade the Dinatomaton and keep the blade. Which is probably a little better. They do go for the attack. Ooh, whoa. It's going to say I'm perfectly happy with the double blocking there and abrading the Automaton. Um, but if they're going to send the Militia in too, I think I'm even happier to Necromage the Militia, Abrade the Dinatomaton, and Tithing Blade the Axe Draw. 
And then I still have the snail around for some bigger blocks later. Some multi-blocking to go around. I guess I could get the snail engraved just for Chupacabra Echo there. There's actually a pretty solid argument in doing that. That might have been better, come to think of it. It probably would have. Speaking of things that don't get played instinctually here, is it actually better to just play Strider and hit them for 5 in the sky than just play the Blade on the Axe Draw? Because I can still Tithing Blade a 4-3 Menace next turn. Slightly weaker than Axe Draw, but not by a lot. I think it's actually just better to jam out Gold Fury Strider. Yeah, we could have had a better lock last turn. I think we probably should have just let the Snail go to the grave um, and killed the slightly bigger threat. But we can make up for it a little this turn by finding the slightly better play than Tithing Blade. Andrew's going ham with Deep Cavern Bat. Not a very instinctual play. Instinctually, you see one big creature on your opponent's board, and you're like, I want a Tithing Blade that. This is my opportunity. It's my one chance to know I'm killing something big with it. But when we've got a real good thing to do with our mana, we should probably do that instead. All right. And yeah, they jam out the Dinatomaton, and we're still just taking it over with a Deep Cavern Bat. To the point where do I lattice away the Tithing Blade? Doubt it. We're not casting Chupacabra Echo right now. Yeah, let's just tithing played one of these dorks and keep going. Keep going in there with Deep Cavern Bat. Yep, 5-4 means Gold Fury Strider dies on attacks. Yeah. These fungus tokens are actually putting in work with Gold Fury Strider. If I hit for seven two turns in a row, that's lethal. So if I put one more permanent on board, ah, it's so awkward. Yeah, I'm going to play a Lattice and not do anything with it, just so I have one more permanent, because it threatens a two-turn lethal in the sky. Feels worth it. You ever just cast a two-mana rock? Just doesn't do anything, it's just a rock on the board. Uh, so they're at 6 life. Now they have the blocker for the Deep Cavern Bat. I can juice the heck up out of the Gold Fury Strider instead at this point and flip the Tithing Blade to drain them. Yeah. Trample over for a bit of damage and clear out the Axe Draw here, I guess. And then Chupacabra is a little strong in the future and we drain them for life. Yep. Feels like the play... Oops, not tapping the Gold Fury Strider. Nine power, block take five and die? Yeah, if they don't lose their reach creature, then this puts them dead to Tithing Blade. So they kind of have to block with the reach creature. I mean, our uh, Deep Cavern Bat's going to be hitting for significantly less damage without the Strider. But it is still really nice to get rid of their reach creature. So I think that is still just some action for us. Sunshot Militia. Pretty bad on the defensive here. I mean, not, not useless. A 1-3 does block the 1-1s one -one pretty well. But definitely not ideal. And there's just the concession from our opponent. They know they're taking at least three damage now and another in my upkeep. They're going to one life no matter what. So they are over this game. And we are now five and one. One game away from the end of this event. No matter what happens. One more loss and we're out. One more win and we've made it. And no matter what the results of this game are, we have turned 20 play-in points into 6,000 gems, which is very cool, but would obviously be slightly cooler to have that guaranteed entry into the qualifier weekend. So we'll fight as best as we can here, but we are heading into the final battle, win or lose. Here we are now on the play for the final battle. We have no red sources in this hand, but we have eight in the deck. We know that we have a dead weight for interaction, a Skullcap Snail to do something, and if I draw any land, we have a Necromage turned three. It is a risky hand. 
basically a mulligan to five if we don't hit a couple red sources. So if we mulligan to six and then we half the mulligan again, then it would have been better to just keep this anyway. And obviously if I'm really lucky and I top deck a red source, then it would have just been better to keep this. Oh, there is risk here. I don't love being in this position of having a rough mulligan decision like this in the final battle. And I guess we have nine red sources technically. We have eight and a sunken citadel. Nine out of 33, about one in three. A little lower than I want. A little lower than I want. I'm going to go for the mulligan here, unfortunately. And this is not a great place to start, but at least it has all of our colors. We can Sunken Citadel on blue, Restless Events for black and red. And then I just start with that Deep Cavern Bat, control what's in my opponent's hand a little bit, have some cheap interaction. We need to draw some gas here for sure, but this is not a mulligan. Get that Restless Vents out to play the Deep Cavern Bat, turn two. Ooh, one of the best one drops in the format. Our opponent starts with a Spyglass Siren. Now having the Deep Cavern Bat and the Dreadmaw's Ire means we can just deal with that, which is nice. I'm just gonna get the second red source out so I can play Ire and a Braid next turn if I need to. If our opponent just attacks with this thing, then I guess we're not getting much action out of Dreadmaw's Ire. Ooh, Spring-Loaded Sawblades. They kept a monocolored hand, though. They have to draw into a white source to use the Sawblades. But I don't have any way to kill a Kalpakal, and if this resolves, it's drawing them the best card out of the top two basically every turn. The other issue is... <laughs> This brackish blunder, I basically just don't get to attack. Right? Because if I take the blunder... God dang it. If I take the blunder, then they can saw blades if they hit a white source. If I take the saw blades, they can blunder no matter what. And just bounce the bat back to their hand and cast their card. I think I have to just get rid of this rare. That's going to be an insane card draw engine. And just not attack with Deep Cavern Bat basically ever. I mean, I can attack with it and then recast it. If they don't have a white source, they can bounce it back to my hand and then I recast it to re-exile the rare. So there's that. But I can't Dreadmaw's Ire on the bat when they have double blue up. Unlucky Drop is their next card, so they're going to mill that to the map token. They are going to attack in. I can't use Dreadmaw's Ire on blocks. So we might as well attack with the Deep Cavern Bats. So once they have five mana, they can bounce my Deep Cavern Bat and play a Culpa Call in the same turn. So that's probably going to be their game plan. Which is unfortunate because I want to Atali's favor the Bat. But if I Atali's favor the Bat, then I'm just letting them bounce my Atali's favor as well. But I'm really wanting a proactive play here. And that's my only proactive play. That's the only way to try to get another creature on this board. Alternatively, I'm just abrading a Siren, which I feel is just worse, most likely. Yeah, I mean, I'm playing into their blunder a little bit, but I'll get the Discover by doing this. If I try to do this to Atali's favor later, when they have two mana up, then I'm completely getting hosed by the blunder because I don't even Discover at that point. So this is probably the best opportunity to cast the Atali's favor. Even if it means some extra value for them when they bounce the bat. No, they found the white source. So now they just saw blades the bat. Before we untap to get a call a call back to their hand. Dreadmaw's eye are looking pretty good though, being able to blow up the saw blades. They're never gonna block with a call a call, so I don't think I'm saving Whoa! Deep Cavern Bat lives another day. So I guess they're just going to blunder in my end step whether or not Deep Cavern Bat is tapped. Yeah, I don't love that. God, yeah, that's a lot of interaction over there. And it ain't good for me. 
that's true. It doesn't have to be tapped. They can just bounce it in the end step and then cast a Kalpa Call on their next turn. Okay. I can Deadweight the Spyglass Siren, or I can cast Deadweight and a Braid on a Kalpa Call later. Two for one myself, but it might be worth it because this card's going to be more than a two for one over time. As soon as it's triggered once, they got a one five and drew the best card out of the top two. That's already a two for one. And with map tokens and craft artifacts and stuff, I think it's just so likely to be able to get more than that much value. That uh, I actually just hold these to be able to try to two for one away the Akalpa call. Yeah, because now they're gonna they're gonna bounce this, cast a Kalpa call, play a one mana artifact if they can. They don't have the five mana to play a Kalpa call and the saw blades in the same turn, so at least there's that. Just gonna not play it at all. I don't know what is going on. So they're just gonna play saw blades without a Kalpa call on board. I guess they want to wait till they have five mana and just play both in the same turn. But then I just deep cavern bat this turn and they don't have the saw blades. I'm very confused. Maybe they have a counter spell here. Guess we'll see. I'm going to be a Braid plus Dead Waiting at Sorcery Speed because I need to stack both onto a call, so we can Pirate and Bat in the same turn off the treasure. Put as much power as we can on board while also seeing what on earth is going on here. That is a Counterspell. Alright. That's fine. Well, then I obviously just don't play into the two-for-one of letting them a call a call plus Saw Blades. Yep, there's the lands. They're they're wanting to play a call on saw blades. Three plus two. And now we've stopped them from doing that during their turn. This was a blind draw, I'm pretty sure. This is what they top decked this turn. Well, here we go. I'm going for it. Okay, by doing that, I can attack with Yearling, they can saw blades it, or I can save the bat to deal with the saw blades. I'm just going to save the attack for when I play the bat. If they hit a sixth mana, they can pirates and... Oh, they actually can't stun without an artifact on board, never mind. I was going to say they could tap the Yearling with the pirates and then kill it with saw blades, but no, they can't. Yeah, I think they also thought they could. Ooh, Chupacabra Echo, actually a sick draw. We're not playing that right now, though, because we want to rip the saw blades out of the hand and start racing. So this also shows us what their other card is. Let's rip that saw blades out of here. Cast it just for fun. I guess that way they have uh, the vehicle side. But I can Dreadmaw's Ire the vehicle if I need to. Alright, looking good for us, actually. One land in their hand. We had to play real diligently here. Things could have been much worse here if we didn't play the way we did, so... I'm pretty happy with myself so far for how I've navigated this game, because it's a lot of stuff I did not like doing at the time. <laughs> like just sitting on my butt and never attacking against all of their stuff that's good against tapped creatures. And then throwing two spells at one a call per call. But I think that's what we had to be doing here. And it's put us in a favorable position. Obviously 7 to 12 doesn't look very good, but with no spells in their hand, when we have an Echo and a Dreadmaw's Ire to cast, things are about to get really nasty for our opponent. They are not going to enjoy this one bit.
No blocks is fine by me. Do I want to cash in the Dreadmaw's Ire just to get that saw blades out of here and gain a little more life? Feels reasonable to me. But I'm also hitting for six, going to eight life and then killing the flyer. They have four power on board after that. Eight life, four power. I don't think I'm doing anything here if I don't need to then. And then we echo away the flyer. The one that doesn't do anything when it dies and is also a bigger creature. Now they're down to six with a Dreadmaw's Ire in our hand and a Restless Vents we can activate. We have the mana to do both next turn. There's a Glorifier of Suffering, which can buff their board, but not enough to kill us at eight, even if we had no blockers up. But especially not with a 3-2 that we can chump the pirates with. All right, they're at six life. How likely are we to lethal here? I think likely enough that we go for it. I mean, we find some kills with Dreadmaw's Ire. And there's no artifact to kill anymore, but right, like, they block here, we trample over and kill that, go to nine. All right, so, like, worst case scenario, thanks to Dreadmaw's Ire, we can be at nine life here, which is only going to die if they don't lose any creatures on this block, and the only way for them to not lose any creatures on this block is for them to just die. So, we just go for it, right? Why did that only cost two mana? Oh, because the Sunken Citadel adds two mana towards the land ability? That's so funny. Okay. Cute synergy. Cute synergy I didn't even know we had. Just flavor text on the Sunken Citadel there. All right, double draw. Screaming Phantom is not a horrible draw if we don't kill them this turn. We probably just kill them this turn, no matter how they block. Now that I'm looking at, now that I'm looking at this, but you know, math is for blockers. It is what it is. Four damage to them right now. Seven damage if I give the echo trample. One, two, three, four, five plus two plus two, six, seven. Yep. And there you have it. That is a six and one run down to the grindstone there. We played as many games as possible. Had to get a loss in there so we could play just a little more magic today. Uh, but that's going to be a victory. One and done in this qualifier playing event, which is really cool. Very awesome to have qualified for the qualifier weekend next weekend. Obviously, that means we'll have a video coming up for that, and that's going to be very exciting. The one flaw with this plan, the one issue with getting the one and done winning on the first attempt of the qualifier playing event is uh, now I have to wait until the next limited qualifier weekend to use the rest of my 58 playing points. So, I mean, you know, you win some, you lose some. We've gotten uh, 6,000 gems out of these playing points. Could get more if I just grind it out, even though I already have the qualifier weekend entry, but I'd rather save these playing points for a future qualifier weekend that I'm not qualified for. So really, really nice run today getting the 6k gems and the qualifier weekend entry. One last look at the deck, show off the goods right here. Uh, was a pretty interesting sealed build in that we looked at a bunch of different options that all looked solid between black green, black red, and red green, but in the end, probably do always want to slide in and use the deck that is pocketing the most rares into your deck. Um, and that's what we did here. And we got a lot of use out of these lands. These were tremendously helpful to the mana base for the Belligerent Splash, which didn't actually do anything. So maybe we just shouldn't have played the Belligerent in the first place. But I still really liked all of the lands in here, which was pretty nice. And uh, yeah, the deck in general, having this many two drops was great. A lot of high quality cards, the cheap removal spells, the cheap interaction, everything played really well. And I really, really enjoyed this qualifier playing event. But that'll do it for today's events. We're getting our 6,000 gems and our qualifier weekend token. And that's it for the qualifier playing. But there are some really spicy things coming up next weekend. Obviously, 
I will be doing a video of the Qualifier Weekend event, the day one event at least. That is a one-time chance event. If we lose, I think, three rounds in the Qualifier Weekend day one, we're out. You don't get to re-enter at all, no matter how many gems you try to throw at Wizards. So, we'll definitely have a Qualifier Weekend Day 1 video, but we'll only have a Day 2 if I play really, really well and get decently lucky to go with it. So, look forward to that if you are interested in seeing some more competitive Lost Caverns of Ixalan sealed. But we've also got a really spicy event next weekend as well. On December 8th, they are adding a win a box chaos sealed event and that means that it's a chaos sealed event you can play for 5000 gems anybody on arena can play it for the 5000 gems you get one chance you can't throw any more gems at it after that to go for any extra runs and it's chaos sealed it's like one pack from six different sets against a bunch of other people so it's going to be a high variance limited format but if you win, if you get, I think, six wins before two losses, just like this event, you could win a physical, actual paper booster box. You get a magic con in a box, which is like a booster box of mystery boosters and some other stuff, some special promos or something like that, but actual physical paper magic cards shipped to your dress. So that's a very cool event that's going on from December 8th to the 10th, if you're interested in playing that. And sometime within that time span, I'll have a video of that event up on the channel as well. That might have to wait till the 10th for me, obviously, because I'll have the qualifier weekend going on at the same time. So we'll see when the video pops up, but we'll certainly be doing a video of that as well. So really cool stuff on the horizon if you're interested in that. But for now, that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the video and you're interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more. Magic Arena.